Hello, and welcome back to Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. Today, we're going to come to the core of the argument. And this is why the lecture is called Beyond Networks and not Against Networks, for example. So what I want to do is I want to talk about how we can use network analysis to find out what a network does and the central problem with that approach, which is sort of a mantra that I want you to repeat over and over and over again for the rest of this lecture. That mantra is structure does not determine function. And that is also the title of the lecture today. Structure does not determine function. Repeat with me, structure does not determine function. If you remember one thing from this lecture, please let it be this. So what we did last time is we looked at network analysis, network graphs, graph theory, and sort of uh, I tried to give you a very quick outline of what this sort of structural uh, perspective gives you in terms of um, understanding the underlying system. Remember when we talked about uh, models as epistemic tool, Tarja Knutila's uh, approach, she said, your approach constrains what you can do. So how does the network approach, graph approach, constrain what we can do? Well, first of all, it is a statistical analysis of, on sets of nodes and interactions, edges of networks. And it analyzes the structure of those sets. Okay. It is ideal for sort of the big data sets that we have available today, omics data sets, interactions between proteins, transcription factors, and gene regulatory networks, neuronal networks, social networks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of data available. Remember that the data are always fit to the model just as much as the, the model is sort of fit to the data. It's, it's sort of a, a symbiotic relationship. And the, the main aim, as we saw, of this type of analysis is to understand uh, the robustness uh, of these networks against perturbation and also their connectedness. For example, how fast can a signal travel or a virus travel in a global network? Um, but what these methods don't do is they don't tell you what the system does. Remember, this is what we set out to explain in the first place. I said much earlier that there are real systems out there, they're, they're sort of pattern processes, and we want to understand why are these pattern processes happening and how are they happening? This is a different uh, thing from what network analysis does. So we need to move from a sort of statistical correlational analysis to something that gives us a causal explanation. We'll be busy with that for a few lectures, actually. So let's get back to this idea. Maybe a good strategy to understand what a network does is getting back to the idea um, that nature is somehow decomposable or almost decomposable. Herbert Simon's notion of near decomposability where he says everything is connected but some things are more connected than others and we want to sort of home in on those. The world is a large matrix of interactions in which most of the entries are very close to zero and in which by ordering those entities according to their orders of magnitude a distinct hierarchic structure can be discerned. And this structure uh, we sort of arrived at a little bit uh, last time is this, this fact that, that systems, uh, biological complex adaptive systems they're modular, and you can sometimes see this modularity at the structural level. Um, this is called community structure. It means that some nodes in a network are more clustered amongst each other than connected to other clusters of nodes. And you can see a nice uh, example here from an actual data set uh, of, I think, protein-protein interactions. Modularity not only holds the key towards uh, making um, robust uh, networks robust against perturbation by limiting the spread of perturbations, but they also hold the key to understanding what a complex network does by us subdividing it into smaller chunks that we can actually understand. And this is sort of a very common strategy. Here's a very famous example from my own 
field of research of Ivo Divo, Eric Davidson, and Doug Irwin in a, in a very famous paper in 2006 in Science have uh, sort of introduced this method. And it looks at this big network that they have that describes the early development of a sea urgent, the specification of its endoderm and its mesoderm. So this endomesodermal specification network can be subdivided in different ways. One way is already indicated on the graph itself. These different colored boxes indicate genes that are active at different times in different tissues during development. But you can do more than this. For example, you can home in on those components and those interactions of the networks that are most conserved in evolution. We'll come back to that later on. Uh, but also are sort of the core um, factors that, that are at the very center of the network. And uh, Davidson and Irving called these the, the kernels of the network. And you can see a little trick of this network here. Basically, the same genes are repeated in different places. Uh, here's one, blimp one, crocs, blimp one, crocs. Also here, blimp one, crocs. That's because this is a transcription factor that is so central and important that it's redeployed in different contexts during development. So these parts of the network are most conserved and uh, the most sort of uh, central to the functioning of the network. We'll get back to what that means, the function of the network. Other sort of parts of the network, they mediate between those different parts, you know, these different color boxes, for example. Here you have the uh, delta ligand of the notch signaling pathway. And you can see there's a connection that goes from the, the pink box here to the blue box over here. Uh, Davidson and Irvin call these sort of um, uh, subcircuits uh, switches or input-output devices. You already get the point here that the computer metaphors are very important to them. And so it's not surprising that they call the further downstream parts of the network plugins, just like you have different plugins for your computer, uh, which, for example, in this case, uh, lock certain cells into a specific fate, which is to become skeleton in the larva. And uh, so these are transcription factors and they mediate the effect that is coming from the kernel via these switches down to uh, what they call the skeletogenic differentiation gene battery, a differentiation, uh, differentiation gene battery is the sort of set of genes that are uh, actually enacting um, the changes, the differentiation changes in a cell. So they are uh, structural proteins, uh, for example, cadherins, you can see here, and other uh, factors um, that are uh, causing the actual differentiation. So this is a sort of a, uh, a non-mathematical way of subdividing a, net, uh, subdividing a network. But we want to be a little bit more rigorous than that maybe. And there's a very sort of interesting approach that you could take. And that is not only looking at local structure of the network, but also uh, looking at how often a certain structure reoccurs in a network. So this is work from about 20 years ago, um, which introduced the idea of a network motive. So what you do to identify a motive is you, first of all, you enumerate, for example, for three nodes in a network, all the different connections that you can imagine. And here in the lower part uh, of the slide, you see the 13 different types of uh, connected subgraphs that you can have. This is the complete set of interactions of directed graphs between three nodes. There are 13 different combinations. And up here, they're telling you that these networks can stand for anything, transcriptional regulation, uh, neuronal uh, connections, or uh, being eaten in a food web. It doesn't matter. So this is a very abstract analysis again. So you can take this set of subgraphs and say, OK, let's look at all the different subsets of three uh, nodes in my network and count how many times each of those 13 different types of uh, subgraph occurs. Okay, and we're going to focus for what follows on this specific motive here, which is called the feed-forward motive. Quick rant, this is sometimes called a feed-forward loop. Okay, do not ever call this a loop. It is not a loop. There is no feed-forward loop. Look here, number nine, this. This is a loop. There's an arrow starting from this node to the other nodes coming back to this node. 
That is a feedback loop. There's a very clear mathematical definition. The feed forward motive starts here, flows away from this node and never comes back. Okay, there is a branch in the pathway, but there is no loop. So don't ever, ever, ever call this a feedback, a feed forward loop. Feed forward means there is no loop by definition. So the, the idea of a feed forward loop is a contradiction in terms. It doesn't make any sense at all. So please, everyone, stop calling it that. End of rant. So we are looking at the feed forward motive and uh, we want to, to see how often does it occur in a specific network. So let me give you a definition of network motives first. So network motives are patterns of interconnections that recur in many different parts of a network at frequencies much higher than those found in randomized networks. What does that mean? So not only do you go and count, for example, these feed forward motives in your network here, they're indicated by these red dashed lines, but then you generate a set of randomized networks, which have the sort of same in degree, out degree, same set number of nodes and connections uh, as your network, but they're randomly rewired. And then you count how many of those motives you have in those sets of different networks. And then you can do some statistics and you can check whether the number of motives you have in your particular case is significantly different from the average number that you expect in a random network. And that's been done here. This is obviously an example that has a lot compared to only two uh, feed forward motives here. So uh, clearly this is probably statistically uh, significant, otherwise they wouldn't show it in this paper. And, but this is sort of the way you go about it, not only do you identify a specific structure, but you also, it's only a motive if it's enriched, if it occurs more frequently than you would expect it to in a random network. And so uh, the first study to use this approach looked at the transcriptional regulatory network of the bacterium E. coli. And here you can see this absolutely fantastic graph that shows you the entire uh, 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 regulatory network of E. coli and all the different um, motives in it. And you can see every triangle here is a feed forward motive. It has a relatively flat structure. Uh, other networks are very different. And this is uh, what these authors found out around uh, uh, in the group of, of Urielon around the turn of the century. But let's look at sort of what they did is they subsampled uh, the, the transcriptional network of E. coli. So they took different sort of uh, sections of it, set networks from it with increasing size. And they looked how many times does this feed forward motive occur compared to what they would expect. And so down here with the error bars is a series of, of measurements in these randomized sort of sets. And, and as the network goes, uh, uh, grows bigger, you can see that you would expect less and less frequent occurrences of this feed forward motive. And also, of course, the error gets smaller as your sample size increases. On the other hand, the real occurrence of this particular motive stays more or less the same across all these sort of uh, networks. So if you have a specific, so here is the threshold where the result becomes significant. And so as if you have a, a network that's sufficiently big, you can be uh, doing the sort of statistics that allows you to detect significantly enriched um, network motives. So it's, again, it's a big network approach, but not only based on structure, but also uh, from this enrichment, you sort of infer that these motives must have some sort of function maybe, but that's very, very hotly debated. And what's interesting is if you look at different types of networks, you see different types of motives that, that emerge. Um, this is a beautiful uh, graph here uh, from uh, a study from 2004, also from Yuri Elon's lab, um, that shows all the 13, down here on the x-axis, you see all the 13 different combinations of subgraphs among three nodes, okay? And so what they did is they looked at how much they are enriched and that the, the y-axis is a statistical score uh, of significance for the en enrichment of a specific motive, okay? The whole thing is called a triad significant profile. Triad because it's three nodes and then how significant uh, is the enrichment of e each of those motives. And then you have four different classes of networks. Up here are transcriptional regulatory networks 
not just from E. coli, but also from other microorganisms like yeast uh, and bacillus subtilis. Um, down here you have signal transduction networks and sort of much uh, smaller at the time data sets for transcriptional regulatory networks in fruit flies, Drosophila, and sea urchins. Again, the sea urchin here. And also in the uh, neuronal network uh, of the worm C. elegans that was reconstructed at the time. Down here, technological networks. So these WWW networks are obviously some sort of subsets of uh, the World Wide Web. Uh, data set number two is uh, websites related to Shakespeare. Um, and uh, I forget what the others are. Social networks as well. So they are very similar. World Wide Web, social networks between uh, prison inmates, uh, sociology, sophomores, and, and other very strange uh, partitions, parts of the society are depicted here. And down here, you have a very interesting network. So these are adjacency networks of words. So in English, French, Spanish, Japanese, and a, a very abstract bipartite model in which two different groups of entities uh, preferentially uh, associate with each other. And you can see that the, the significance profiles for each class, superclass of these different networks differs and you can group them based on this profile. Okay, what's striking here is that the transcriptional regulatory network of E. coli and these other microorganisms only has one enriched uh, uh, triad and that, not surprisingly, is the feed-forward mode of again, which also is enriched in eukaryotic transcriptional and signaling and neuronal networks. So that really piqued people's interest because it seems that biological regulatory networks have that motive enriched while technological networks don't. But the situation is a bit more complicated than that. So we need, you remember that we had undirected graph and graphs and directed graphs. We need to add a little bit more complexity to study transcriptional regulation with a graph theoretical approach. That's because there are transcriptional interactions that are uh, positive activation or negative repression. So um, we need to add signs to our inter interactions. And so you get a signed directed graph. The way this works, is you label all those interactions that are positive with a plus uh, indicated in blue here and all those that are negative with a minus is indicated in red. Okay, just to introduce some, some notation, what we're gonna do from now on is not use the plus and minus notation because it's a bit clumsy, but we're gonna use arrows for positive interactions and sort of T bars for repressive negative interactions from now on. So this gives us a sort of a, a, an additional dimension to look at the structure of motives. And so we can revisit this sort of transcriptional regulatory network of E. coli. And you can see that here you have positive regulation in blue and negative regulation in red, just like in the graph I showed you before. So they did this already for the, the E. coli uh, regulatory graph. And so then uh, you, on these uh, signed directed graphs, you can identify um, a whole range of different motives. Um, a bunch of classical examples of, are shown here. So you could have negative autoregulation. This can be direct or it can go through intermediate steps, by the way, which are not shown here. Positive autoregulation. So this is auto uh, activation. Negative autoregulation is auto inhibition. The feed forward motive, of course, uh, they identified uh, what they called signal input modules where one transcription factor was responsible for a whole range of targets, maybe with different sensitivities. And then uh, what they called these dense overlapping, uh, overlapping regulons that, that allowed them to partition the, the transcriptional network of E. coli into these big chunks, where uh, there's sort of a shared set of transcription factor that uh, regulates an overlapping set of targets. There are more, uh, and obviously it's not, it's sort of uh, a little arbitrary to set up different, uh, you know, uh, classifications of motives, we'll, we'll encounter a few more motives as we go along. But if you actually zoom in on, on the, the, the feed-forward motive itself, now that you have signed interactions, there's a whole zoo of network motives within the, the feed-forward motive, because you, every interaction could be uh, activating or, or, or uh, repressive. So you can subdivide very roughly uh, these feed-forward motives into two classes. 
coherent and incoherent feedforward motives. The coherent ones have uh, no contradictions in the two pathways. For example, the type one feedforward motive here has a direct activation of X on Z and an indirect activation of X uh, on Z through Y on the other branch. While incoherent motives, here you have an activation of X on Z and then a repression, overall repression of X uh, by a Y on Z, which doesn't sort of make sense at the first glance, but we'll have a look at that. So within this single motive of the, the feedforward motive, there are at least eight different uh, types of, of motives. And it gets worse because, of course, where the two branches meet, you can have different functional forms. For example, here we assume that the two branches reunite through an AND function. So both the direct activation by X and the indirect activation by Y need to be present to activate a rate C. And what we can do now with, with such a simple motive is we can study what it does. We can model it. And often these networks are so simple that we can even get an intuition of how they work. The idea is therefore to get that sort of knowledge of what they do and then to put them together again and to learn what the whole network do, does basically by, it's like Lego bricks for networks. You build the whole network again uh, from after you dissected it. And um, basically it's, it's assumed that the main, the whole network will just be a sort of a, uh, uh, a combination of the behaviors of these motives. Okay, so, but back to the coherent type one motive here. Uh, what does it do? It seems completely redundant, right? So there's two activation pathways, but one of them is indirect. So what, what it does is imagine that you have an input signal coming in here at the top, and there are two pulses. There's a very, very short pulse of signal that immediately induces a very short pulse of expression of X, and then there's a longer pulse that uh, has a more sustained expression of X. So if you imagine, so X will immediately uh, try to activate Z, but it can only do that through Y, if it, it signals through Y as well. Okay, so it needs to activate Y first. And so if you have a very short pulse of X, there is a gradual buildup of Y, but it never sort of reaches the threshold that it needs to activate Z. Okay, so that's the idea. So this short pulse is filtered out and only a sustained pulse will build up enough Y to get expression of Z. So here is the output of Z, and you can see that it only reacts, it only responds to the sustained pulse while filtering out short uh, sort of pulses. This, so this motive can act as a persistence detecting filter. It will filter out noise, brief signals that the, the organism doesn't need to, to detect. And indeed, there are systems like the Arabinos um, metabolizing system in E. coli that work like this. And you can experimentally show that the principles that this, this simple toy model um, uh, implements, that they apply to the processing of arabinose, uh, induction of arabinose processing in E. coli. Okay, so let's turn to the incoherent uh, uh, feed forward motive, which is a little weirder, right? So there, there, there seem to be two branches to contradict each other. So what's, what happens if you have a signal that switches on and stays on here. You get, of course, an induction of X, uh, and at the same time also uh, Y is building up, and um, you get an activation of Z. But at some point, Y will reach the threshold at which it starts to inhibit Z. So basically, Z builds up, and then as Y continues to build up, it'll be degraded again to a certain level. This has two effects. The main effect is that the incoherent type one feed forward motive can act as a pulse generator. Okay, so you end up with a pulse of Z. And um, interestingly also, uh, the response that it, it shows here in the, in, in the beginning is faster than if you just had a normal uh, single basic transcriptional activation. So this is an interesting uh, type of behavior. And again, you can find it in the galactose processing system of E. coli, uh, uh, which implements such an incoherent feedback um, motive. So, wow, cool. This is great. So all we have to do is sort of go, we take a complicated network. Let's take a more complicated example. Here is the uh, C. urgent early developmental network. And we need to sort of subdivide it into small enough motives so we can understand 
uh, what the whole network does. This was actually done in this uh, posthumous paper by Peter uh, and Isabel Peter and Eric Davidson after he was uh, already deceased that showed, attempted this for the whole sea urchin network. Okay, so this is great. Divide and conquer. We uh, exploit the near decomposability of complex adaptive systems to get down to their basic parts. If we understand those parts, we understand the behavior of the whole system. Seems like a great strategy, right? So what, what could be the problem? What is the problem with this approach? The problem is quite simple. It does not work. So sometimes it does, you get lucky, right? We saw that, especially in a very flat transcriptional regulatory network like that of E. coli, these motives, once you've identified them, they're really strongly sort of uh, separated from the rest of the regulatory apparatus. It's a very flat network. There's not a lot of sort of feedback interaction. So you can separate those little modules and they actually do what you predict them to do. But if you try to do this for an animal like Drosophila or a sea urchin or any more complex system, the economy, whatever, it won't work because these complex systems are heavily feedback driven and they're much harder to decompose than an E. coli regulatory system. And the main problems are twofold. There's two problems. Let's have a look at our little toy model here again. Let's uh, find uh, feed forward motives in here. There is an incoherent one, type one, as it happens, between V6, uh, V2, and V3. Okay, but you see immediately there's a, there's a complication. There is an additional backward uh, interaction here. And this often happens, of course. So what is immediately clear here is that network context matters. So we can't just count all the different instances. Um, we need to sort of keep track of all the interactions and the context because they will affect how a motive works. We'll come back to that in a second. Just another point. The second problem, of course, is well, let's look, look at this feed-forward motive here, which is a type 1 coherent one between V4, V6, and V2. And um, what we find is that, uh, whoa, actually, this is a feed, feed, feedback loop. Imagine it's a feed-forward motive, <laughs> or take it as a feedback loop. But the main point is, so now, in this case, we have... Uh, identified all the interactions between those nodes. We'll come back to sort of discuss what does that mean, all the interactions. It's really hard to actually identify all the, the relevant interactions. It's always arbitrary to remember which interactions and nodes you include in a system. But so here we should be fine. But the problem is even here, even this simple circuit exhibits many different types of dynamics. This is a feedback loop, not a feed forward motive again. I apologize for the confusion. What, what happens is that even this simple circuit will behave in many different ways, depending on the precise strength and also the nature of the interaction. So it, it matters a lot whether this is, you know, a transcriptional interactions, translational, protein-protein you know, binding, whatever. The details matter in all these cases. And um, of course, if you get a different dynamic behavior, depending on the sort of nature and the strength of those interactions, you usually also get an effect on function. So if a circuit, a motive, behaves in a different way, it also has a different function. Not always, not necessarily, but most of the time. So let me illustrate these two problems. So the, the sort of structure does not determine dynamics problem, and also the network context with a, a, a simple example. I'll introduce two more motives here. One is called the repressilator. It comes, uh, it, was, it was built, one of the first synthetic circuits to be built by Elowitz and Leibler in 2000, beautiful paper. And so what it does, you can model it very exhaustively. What it does, it can do two things. It can oscillate. What I'm showing you here is a mouse pre-submitting mesoderm, it doesn't matter, but you can see oscillating pulses of gene expression. So this sort of circuit can produce sustained stable oscillations goes on oscillating on and on and on or depending on the the uh, strength of the interaction it can uh, produce an oscillation that will go away after a while this is called a damped oscillation 
So basically, we'll go through the expression of these three genes, the, the green one, the red one, the blue one, and you will cycle through them. And at, at some point, it will stop or it won't stop. OK, I'm not mentioning the default behavior of this circuit. For most uh, strengths uh, inter of the interactions, for most combinations, this circuit doesn't do anything. No expression at all. And that's the case for most circuits. You need to tune them quite finely to get uh, the behavior you would expect to be their default behavior in many, many cases. So that's one problem. But now, if you add just one more interaction, and that's what we're going to do, just like in that example I gave you before. So if you add one back interaction between two of the factors, you get a really cool circuit. It's called the ACDC circuit. The reason it's called that is because it has both a positive and a negative feedback loop. You see, three negative interactions are a negative feedback loop here, and two negative interactions, so the negative, double negative uh, inhibition of an inhibitor, that's a positive interaction overall. And so this has a positive and a negative uh, interaction. And it can do a lot more uh, ba based on those two different um, feedback loops. It can do whatever the repressor has been doing, the oscillations, damped or stable. But it can also switch between the green and the red genes, stably, either green on or red on, if these two interactions are strong enough. Or it can do something really cool. It can implement the switch between the green and the red that is basically going back and forth, just like in this little movie. This is called a relaxation oscillation. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is by adding just one interaction in context, even if that interaction is weak, it can create a whole new repertoire of behaviors that this circuit can possibly implement. So it is extremely difficult to just, you know, pick out motives and say they do this and then put them together. Because remember, even just the choice of how many nodes you look at, three or four, also four no node motives have been looked at, et cetera, is pretty arbitrary, right? At which level are you going to look at them? So network context and the nature and the strength of the interaction are crucial for the behavior. And so depending on those um, parameters of the system, you get all kinds of different behavior, and even a very, very simple network like a repressulator has three different behaviors, nothing at all, two different types of oscillation, and this simple ACDC circuit can do five qualitatively different things. Okay, three types of oscillations, switch-like behavior, and also, of course, most of the time, it does nothing at all. Okay, so this is the crux of the matter here. You cannot infer what a complex network does from just looking at its structure. It is impossible to understand the function of a network. You need to understand what it does and what it can do. And this is what we use dynamical models for. OK, so what you need to do is you need to switch from one type of explanation of networks, the one that is based on graph theory. And that's been called topological, because it's structural, explanation to a more causal, that is a mechanistic explanation. What does this network do? And I will tell you in the lecture that comes up next what I mean by mechanistic explanation. I hope you tune in again next time. And uh, as always, thanks for listening.